Late in the summer of 1977, two Californians set out on an endurance run that would take them from the bottom of Death Valley to the top of Mount Whitney, continental America's highest peak. Their objective was to cover the 144 miles in two days. This course was first created and run in 1973 by English adventurer Ken Crutchlow and San Franciscan Pax Beale. Their time of 54 hours was the record until September 1974 when Tate Miller and Bruce Maxwell lowered it by three hours. They had decided to try it again, to better their old record if they could. They would head north along Highway 190 toward Stovepipe Wells, Lone Pine, and on to Mount Whitney. It was decided that Bruce would begin the race at 4 a.m. leaving Badwater, a scummy saltwater pond located at Death Valley's lowest point. I'm doing the run because so few new experiences remain in the 20th century. Predetermined rules called for the 144 road and trail miles to be run as a relay. I would spend hours in the days before the event trying to imagine what it was going to be like. Each man would run for a half hour while the other rested in a support van, which carried vital supplies of food and water. We actually tried to hold our pace at about nine minutes a mile, but for me, it just got to be absolutely too slow. It pounds you to death over any period of time. Hey, John, you hear about them guys running from Badwater over to Mount Whitney today? Yeah, I got wind out here a little while ago. You think you're going to make it? Yeah, well, we got a pretty rough chance out. Takes a lot of guts, that's for sure. Yeah, me, I think they're crazy. Yeah, they got the other mile somewhere along the line. Where do you think they are by now? I don't know, they're probably getting down around about them foothills by now, I suppose. Yeah. Somewhere in that area there. Hey, John, I think I see them over there. Look yeah, they're coming. They're in there. Yeah. Man, those guys are really, really getting hot. Look at that little thing. heat and the long hours of running drove the fluids from their bodies. The sun evaporated their sweat even before it could reach the surface of their skin. They drank large quantities of water, Gatorade and ERG, a high energy solution to maintain the delicate balance of their body fluids.
the hours passed, the miles slid by, and still the road seemed to go on forever. It's absolutely amazing how much help that you really need from the support crew when you're doing something like this. If it weren't for Sue and Gloria there at, at every pit stop, basically, with something cold to drink, something to eat, someone to take your shoes off and rub down your feet, it would have been impossible to do. Yeah, sucks. began to cramp up due to an electrolyte imbalance caused by his excessive loss of body fluids and he was forced to retreat to the van. Harder underneath. Tate ran on, hoping that Bruce would recover soon. They still had to climb out of the Panamint Valley before they could get to Whitney's foothills. Bruce was being treated by the ever-present support crew with liquids and supplemental trace minerals to restore his body. Grab out a bottle because body almost on it. Later, the cramps spread from my hands, up my arms, across my shoulders, down my back, and into my legs. It was an electrolyte imbalance, but I couldn't tell if I had taken too many potassium and sodium tablets or too few. When not running, I'm a graduate student at Berkeley and a tennis pro in San Francisco. On weekends, friends and I usually escape to the Sierra for climbing and backpacking. I always seem to get involved in endurance adventures, and in one sense or another, they seem to support my lifestyle. Although my livelihood is teaching tennis, I enjoy playing with friends, often Bernard, one of my journalism professors. at Panamint Springs at 3.10 p.m. They were almost four hours ahead of their previous time, but it was all uphill from here on. Bruce would have to get better soon. Running has always been a tremendous form of escape for me. Even while I was at Berkeley, it was a way to relieve the pressures of school. And now that I spend 60 to 70 hours a week at work, running is still the only escape I have. It's the only place I can really be alone with myself. Bruce, knowing that he could not run for his entire half hour, managed to walk for 15 minutes before Tate suggested that he return to the van to rest and try to regain his strength. When you're doing something like this with someone, there's sort of an unspoken word that whoever's feeling the strongest will carry the brunt of the load. You never know who it's going to be either. On any given day, one guy can feel a lot better than the other guy, and it's just something that both runners have to face is that it might not be your day, and if it's not, you simply have to kick back and recuperate what strength you can and let the other guy carry your load for a while. The evening brings a refreshing coolness to the air, but this same cool air made Tate's muscles ache and stiffen. During the night, Bruce recovered and resumed running.
After a few relays, Tate climbed into the van for a much needed rest. He had been running and walking for more than four hours. Still, the most strenuous part was yet to come, Mount Whitney itself, and the rules required that they both climb the mountain together. Mount Whitney, they would run to the top together, leaving behind the comforts of the van. The support crew would now travel ahead of them so that the runners would not have to carry the heavy supplies of food and warm clothing that would be needed at the top if they got to the top. There's a real bizarre psychology involved in forcing yourself to continue in something like this. I know at different points in the race you feel like you're sitting there and your body is giving you this very negative feedback, trying to get you to quit. I simply kept telling myself, look, you've just got to finish what you're doing at this very minute. You've got to extend it out over a day or a weekend. And if you can just keep doing the same thing, the event will soon be over. And somehow that works for me. adrenaline-based rush of energy that had propelled them up the lower part of the mountain soon dissipated. Fatigue, dizziness, and altitude sickness slowed their pace and forced them to rest many times as they slowly climbed higher. Maxwell and Tate Miller had run and walked 144 miles, climbed from 279 feet below sea level to the 14,495 foot summit of Mount Whitney in 35 hours and 50 minutes. They had beaten their earlier record time by 15 hours. The long ordeal was over. <laughs> 